All right, Acts chapter 3. So, this, we're going to see Peter's second message here. The first one, of course, on the day of Pentecost, uh, and uh, as the Holy Spirit is poured out, and uh, 3,000 people come to faith uh, in Jesus as a Messiah. Uh, we've got, uh, again, the model of, uh, of evangelism and uh, evangelistic uh, teaching sermons uh, in that first sermon that are uh, excellent. Uh, we looked at that. We looked at uh, the, the model of the church, that how the church grew and the Lord added daily to the numbers. Those were being saved. Uh, last week is because uh, as a group, they were committed to four things. The Apostles' Doctrine, uh, we might say the Bible, uh, to fellowship, uh, which we said is koinonia, a giving of oneself to, uh, to another. Fellowship is, uh, we kind of use that uh, very, very loosely. Uh, the, anytime we're having a cup of coffee and a donut with another Christian, we're in fellowship. But uh, uh, this is, you know, we define that. It's a lot uh, more than that. Uh, the breaking of bread, we uh, specifically identified as communion, which we're going to share here at the, uh, at the end of the service. Uh, and then to prayer. And again, these are things that they uh, believed in or thought were good ideas, but they were absolutely committed to them. And then because of that, the Lord did tremendous things through them. Now, Peter is going to be going into the temple, is going to heal a guy, uh, very dramatic, and it's going to give him the opportunity uh, to deliver his second serve, uh, sermon. Let's take a look at the first 10 verses. We're saying that faith preceded his message, and uh, I think you'll, you'll agree. And now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, uh, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful to ask um, from those who entered the temple, who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, it lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, uh, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened uh, to them. So again, faith preceding, they're going to the temple. And just a few details are really helpful in understanding uh, kind of a lot of the implications and certainly the application for us in terms of the story. Uh, the time is three in the afternoon, you know, the ninth hour, three in the afternoon, which by the way is after, after the sacrifices have already been done. Uh, because uh, again, the apostles, the early believers uh, still continue to go to the temple for all the times of prayer. Uh, and for the uh, teaching opportunities there in Solomon's Colonnade, uh, there was a lot of discipleship going on. And we're going to see uh, Peter uh, taking advantage of the crowds there uh, in this man's healing to preach, uh, preach the gospel. It's also interesting to you know, continue to see uh, Peter and John together. And uh, again, in the fishing business together, uh, they get kind of singled out by Jesus to go ahead and prepare the Passover. Uh, it's, it's Peter and John that run to the, uh, the empty tomb on uh, Easter. Uh, but uh, and all just to say and always in competition with each other, but no longer, uh, no longer uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, no longer in competition, but certainly still uh, still together. Uh, the place uh, is uh, important to note as well in terms of where this guy was actually delivered. The beautiful gate or the Nicanor Gate. Uh, was uh, 75 feet in height. The, the door itself was 60 feet in height, covered with uh, Corinthian bronze. It was uh, beautiful. It was expensive, named after the guy that donated the money, tradition says. Uh, and its, uh, it's uh, placement is important to understand. Uh, at the Temple Mount, and maybe you've seen some of those pictures, you know, if you look down on the Temple Mount from the Mount of Olives, uh, from that uh, vantage point looking below, you know, the Kidron Valley, uh, today, there's the East Gate, which is all, all blocked up and so forth. Uh, that would have been one of the main entrances, uh, either that or uh, the steps to the, to the south that some of it is actually set on and, uh, uh, and heard a teaching about Jesus uh, walking up those steps, which is pretty, uh, uh, pretty awesome. Uh, but uh, either way, and when you enter the Temple Mount, you're in the, quote, court of the Gentiles. Anybody could go in there. Uh, no problem to learn about Judaism, to learn about the one true God, get teaching and so forth. 
Then there was another court, another gate you could walk through where you entered the court of the women. Uh, now, uh, the women obviously could go in there, so could the men and so could the priests, and they are on their way then to the court of Israel. It's getting a little narrower now. Uh, and going into the court of Israel, only the priests, only the men could enter, or we'd say the court of the men sometimes. And of course, there's another gate that takes you into the holy place where the priests did their, uh, their duties. Uh, this man is at the beautiful gate, the Nicanor gate, which is at the gate of the Israel. So in other words, so every time uh, this man is, we're going to find out he's been, he's like 40 years old. Uh, he's been there every day at this gate for a long time, which means uh, that Jesus walked by him many times. Never healed him. Uh, Peter and John walked by him many times. I mean, uh, I don't know if you say 100. I'm, Maybe, maybe that many. Every time they were in Israel, every time they, they went in, they walked right by this guy. Uh, ne never healed him. And I, I just find that to be, uh, uh, to, to be very interesting, which tells us that uh, God heals on his own time schedule. And uh, it's not that Jesus didn't have the ability or the power or whatever he could have. Uh, and uh, it apparently never occurred to Peter and John to uh, reach down to this man uh, either. Uh, passing by him uh, each and every time. But on this occasion, God, uh, through the Holy Spirit, prompts uh, Peter and John to stop, uh, look at the guy, uh, and then to actually uh, uh, pray for him in the name of Jesus, uh, and of course, reach down uh, Peter style, and uh, it's uh, go for broke, and <laughs> grabs the guy and pulls him to his feet. He's either going to be healed or he's going down. But uh, uh, certainly a tremendous faith on, uh, on Peter's point that was not there before, that was just prompted for this particular uh, occasion. Uh, and we cer certainly say, say secondly, uh, that faith preceded Peter in re literally reaching out to this man uh, in his classic line, silver or gold uh, have I none. There's a uh, old commentator that tells the story of uh, a 13th century uh, conversation between Pope Innocent II and Thomas Aquinas. Uh, apparently they had just received a large sum of money from another country uh, and they were counting it. Uh, and uh, Pope Innocent II said to uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, see Thomas, the church can no longer say silver and gold have I none. Thomas replied, true Holy Father, and neither, neither can we say arise and walk. Uh, which was the problem. They had the gold, but no longer the, the power of God, according to Thomas Aquinas in this particular commentary. Uh, but uh, Peter in this classic line is saying, yeah, I'm not going to give you alms, but I can certainly give you something better than that. Uh, and, uh, and certainly uh, it is, uh, there were dramatic uh, results. Uh, this guy is able to walk, to run, to leap. Uh, and it's very interesting. Uh, keep in mind, this is Dr. Luke writing of this particular miracle. Uh, he gives us some language and some details that we don't find uh, anywhere else in the New Testament. The Greek says the man was healed instantly. In other words, everything, everything came together. And just so I get it right, I want a quote from Kent Hughes. He says the word uh, translated feet is only used by Luke and occurs nowhere else. It indicates his discrimination between different parts of the human heel. The phrase ankle bones is again a medical phrase uh, found nowhere else. Uh, the word leaping up describes the coming suddenly into socket or something that was out of place, the articulation of a joint. Uh, this then is a very careful medical description of what happened in connection with this man. Uh, to use our you know, sanctified imagination here a little bit, uh, keep in mind that that means his feet were deformed. Which also, by the way, is maybe explains why he got so excited and didn't run home and tell his, uh, tell his uh, family what happened. But he went right into the temple to worship God, something he had never been allowed to do in his entire life. He was like this from birth. If you're deformed, according to law, you cannot go into the temple proper. That gate was as close as he could ever get to in terms of worshiping God. It's the first place he went, which is a pretty cool, cool response in terms of his place. But, but again, the, the image here... Uh, here's a guy with whose feet are deformed, and they are instantly made made whole. I mean, right right before before everybody. And sometimes I don't think we really kind of get uh, what happens when a healing goes on. Sometimes in the New Testament, there's a couple of occurrences uh, of Jesus that are uh, uh, the same idea where it happens instantly. 
in Matthew's gospel, remember Jesus goes into the synagogue at Capernaum, uh, <coughs> again, a place that we've been to a, a few times, uh, and as he goes in, the enemies of Jesus know that he's going to go to the guy with the greatest need. So they're watching the guy with the withered hand. And they're watching to see if Jesus will heal him on the Shabbat or the Sabbath. <clears throat> of course, Jesus goes to him uh, and does heal him. So again, keep in mind, he's got a hand that is withered. Uh, and Jesus heals him. And before all of their eyes, it just morphs into a completely new, natural, fully functioning hand. I mean... Uh, maybe it helps have seen a few movies, you know, where you see people morph into different things, you know. So that's a guy morphing into an alien. But it's, uh, you know, it's that idea. Instantly something that was very, uh, very twisted and corrupted becomes uh, uh, completely natural and new right before their very eyes. Is that Jesus doesn't take his prayer shawl and go over the guy's hand and go, okay, be healed. And then, oh, right, wow, that's really different. No, they actually watch it. They watch it take place. An even more dramatic one is in, is in Matthew 8. Or a man comes up to Jesus who, uh, the Bible says, he comes up, uh, he's got leprosy, saying, unclean, unclean. Remember the story, Jesus goes up to him. Uh, it says he's full of leprosy. So he, is, uh, he has grotesque uh, uh, defiguration. And uh, the guy probably, you know, the face is deformed, no eyebrows and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and Jesus goes up and heals him. And the same thing, instantly his face is completely, completely changed and made, and made natural. Uh, and that's what's happening here. Just dramatic results. Instantly, uh, instantly healed. And as I said, then this guy heads right in uh, to, to the uh, uh, court, of the, uh, court of the Israelites where he was never able to go uh, before. And Peter, certainly we're going to see uh, that he's, he's going to defuse any attention towards himself. And this guy does the right thing. A lot of times today we have uh, people that have, quote, healing, healing ministries and so forth. Um, and um, <laughs> they, uh, they seem to be, attract a lot of attention to, to themselves uh, as opposed to uh, what this guy did in terms of the power of God. We might illustrate it this way. If you had surgery and, uh, and uh, you know, it was a successful surgery and, uh, and you, you went back to the hospital later to give thanks, I doubt that you'd walk up to the scalpel. Oh, scalpel, thank you. You're an awesome scalpel. No, I think you might actually go to the doctor that did the surgery and say thank you very much. Uh, but yet, uh, far too often, people get caught up into what the Lord has done, and they're thanking the instrument rather than, than God. So this guy gets that right. Uh, he is rightly uh, uh, going into the temple uh, and praising and thanking God. Of course, he creates quite a stir which gives Peter an opportunity to preach, uh, again, his second message. So look at that in verse 11. His message points to Jesus. Now as a lame man who was healed, held on to Peter and John, uh, and apparently has quite the grip on him, uh, and all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us? As though by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied, but you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name... Uh, through faith in his name has made this man strong whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through uh, him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So uh, Peter seizes the opportunity, points the crowd to, to Jesus. Uh, look at verse 13 again to draw their attention. Uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, this Jewish crowd certainly tracking along with that statement, glorified his servant, uh, Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the one uh, that has, uh, has done this. Now, when Peter preaches his first sermon, remember in Acts 2, he's got to refute something. He's got to refute the idea that what is happening and what has come upon them, because they're speaking in a language they do not know, but other people are understanding, he's got to refute the idea that they're drunk. That was one of the accusations. You're, you guys are just drunk. 
And it says, hey, man, it's not even 9 o'clock in the morning. Plus, it's a, it's a, it's a Pentecost. It's a holy convocation. There's no, no way that's happening. And then he quotes Joel uh, to substantiate scripturally what was transpiring before them. That's what he had to refute uh, and deal with. Here he has to refute two other ideas. One is the idea that they themselves had the power to heal. And he, he's very quick to say, <laughs> this is not us. Uh, we don't have the power to heal. Uh, this was God that did this. Uh, and it was done in the, in the name of Jesus. Uh, again, uh, first and foremost, not, not our own power. Nothing that we've done. The guy, and it's not the faith of the guy. The guy's hoping for a couple of shekels. Uh, you know, Peter says silver or gold have I done. <laughs> the guy would probably uh, any kind of spare change is good with me. I wasn't really expecting a lot of gold here. But uh, uh, when he looks at them, he is not expecting to be, to be healed. It's not his faith. Uh, and it's not the power uh, of Peter and John. Uh, when God wants to use us to minister to somebody else, we should never think it's going to be done through our own strength or our own power uh, in any way. Uh, and uh, these, these guys, these are A apostles, uh, opposed to B apostles. I mean, these are the guys. And they're, they're straight out saying, we, we, I wish we could tell you how great we are and just how awesome we are, because I kind of like to write my book. Healing at the Beautiful Gate, only 1995, uh, you know, and have a whole ministry here, you know. And uh, I can teach people, I have seminars that teach them how to lift people up after I've prayed for them. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do any of that. Uh, he doesn't go on TV later or anything. He just says, hey, this was all the Lord, what, what the Lord's done. I'm kind of making a little jest of this thing. But you understand, it's, uh, we've, we've kind of moved away from this very important principle. And I think... Because the emphasis of the stardom of the healer uh, in our own culture here in the West, we've forgotten the idea that God can use any one and every one of us to do some pretty cool, some pretty miraculous things in people's lives. If we're recognized, it's not us. Uh, it's simply the power of God. He disavows any power uh, in and of themselves. He rejects the people's uh, adulation. Now, he's not the only one. Just to give you another example of a, of a godly man that does something like this. Think of Daniel back in Jan, Daniel chapter 2. Uh, he's uh, about ready to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's uh, first dream. Uh, and, of course, uh, everybody's life is on the line. There is a wise man counselor to Nebuchadnezzar. If the dream can't be interpreted, he plans on executing every one of them. Uh, and in that context, it says the king answered and said to Daniel, Whose name was Belshazzar? Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? <coughs> Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there's a God in heaven who reveals secrets. Uh, can, you, can you save everybody and reveal the dream? No, nope, not going to happen. But there's a God in heaven that can tell you. You want to hear what he has to say. Very quick to say, it's, I'm just the instrument here. I'm just a scalpel. I'm not the surgeon. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's what God can do uh, in and through uh, our lives with, say, Peter and Daniel. Secondly, very important, he refutes the idea that the man was healed because Peter and John were somehow living an exceptionally godly life. Look at verse 12 again. As though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk. Sometimes we get that idea as well. I'd like to be used by the Lord, but I'm just not quite there yet. I haven't reached that spiritual plateau. I realize that person over there looks kind of depressed. Maybe I should go talk to him. Maybe I could pray with him, but I haven't had my devotions in like five days. I don't really know that God would really do it. It's not because of their godliness. That, that's what he says, isn't it? It's, it? it's not because of who we are or it's the power of God. Uh, and it's not because of we, we've re been elevated to some kind of status spiritually uh, through our personal disciplines. And I don't want to take away from that. It's important to spend time with the Lord uh, and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if we have the uh, mistaken idea that I have to reach a certain level spiritually, like I'm like one of those guys, whatever those guys are, before God can use my life and minister to somebody else, before I can pray for somebody uh, you may not be ready to, uh, to grab the crippled guy and pull him out of his chair, but you might be able to say, hey, can I pray for you? I hope you have a good day. God bless you. You, know? you just start out with something like that. Uh, and uh, 
uh, both of these ideas should really help us. What Peter is saying uh, to uh, the crowd uh, should minister and help release us in the ministry as well. Secondly, he points to the crowd that their failure, uh, it really is accepting the Messiah. Here he begins to get into his, uh, his message. Again, there's a particular crowd uh, at Pentecost, he, he uh, preached to a group of people that knew the scriptures, was able to refer to them, uh, and uh, he's going to refer to uh, their basic knowledge of current events uh, here. Uh, he reminds them of the fact that they had denied and delivered Jesus up to Pontius Pilate. That's in verse 13. Whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, uh, where he was, uh, when he was determined to let him go. Hey, Pilate was going to let the guy go. Is, is any of this familiar to you guys? This guy Jesus, what I'm saying, that just healed this guy? You remember a few weeks ago and what transpired? Now, some of these guys may not have been in that crowd. And we certainly, as we teach through that section of the Bible, uh, are very careful to make sure that the crowd that is seeing uh, Hosanna, blessed as he comes in the name of the Lord, is not necessarily the same crowd has nothing to do with the crowd that's in, in Pilate's courtyard saying, crucify him, crucify him. Uh, there's still a lot of people saying, uh, let his blood be on us and our children. Oh, that's kind of a heavy, heavy thing to say when you're crucifying the, the Messiah, the king, the king of glory. And, and Peter brings this whole thing up. He's, quite, uh, he's, gonna, he's prosecuting an attorney uh, before he's going to actually bring, uh, bring the good news to him. And he says that Jesus was no ordinary man. He uses several names for him, in particular, the Holy One uh, and the Just, uh, the Prince of Life. But again, but you disowned him, uh, you killed him. And then three, he does this by, uh, by relating uh, Jesus and who he is uh, to, uh, to the miracle itself, verse 16. It, it's his name through faith, and his name has made this man uh, a man strong. And uh, he's saying that Jesus. You see the miracle, and you see the miracle took place. And, it, and the cool thing is they all knew this guy. I mean, they, they all been walking by this guy their whole life, right? The guy's 40 years old. He's there all the time. Uh, is, is, no, it's like, hey, that might be the same guy. No, that's a guy, you know. I mean, uh, his face wasn't changed, just his feet. I mean, they knew exactly who it was. It was an awesome miracle. And Peter was saying, uh, we're just kind of ordinary guys here. Uh, we did this by faith in Jesus. Remember that one that you crucified? Because he's the holy one. He's the just one. Uh, he's, the prince of, he's the prince of life. And, um, and it's in his name. Because name to them, and should be to us, name equates to character and authority. Character and authority. Uh, it's in his name that this is able to be done because of who Jesus is. It's character. He is the Messiah. Uh, he is the Son of God. The power is in his name. Later, he's going to uh, preach and, and say, there is no other name under heaven by which man must be saved. There's only one. It's in the name of Jesus. And we, we don't often relate to this idea of name being so and so important and, uh, and so forth. But, you know, we just say names like JFK, Michael Jordan, Billy Graham. You know, when we get throw out names, it's like, uh, I know who that is or what the guy looks like or what he did or what he read. You know, it kind of conjures up at least something or some kind of image to us. Uh, but uh, if we're familiar with it. But uh, maybe not necessarily this idea of, of character and authority. If you're going to pray for somebody, we need to pray for them in Jesus' name. Uh, that gives us the authority to see God move uh, in that person's life. And what, that's what we see here. I was, uh, I was thinking about this uh, in terms of uh, an, an incident that happened to us when our son was graduating from uh, UPT from pilot training uh, a couple of years ago. And we flew out, of course, for, uh, for the graduation. And my dad and my sister also flew uh, out from California because we'd set Laughlin, uh, beautiful Del Rio, Texas, and, um, which is a lot of sand around it. Big beach there. And uh, so we, uh, we met in San Antonio, and then we drove, we drove out for the same. It's a big deal. And we, dr we drove out for it. And uh, my sister, apparently, uh, leaving the, uh, going through uh, TSA in Sacramento, lost her ID. She didn't get it back in her purse. So she has no picture ID, credit cards, all this stuff. We're getting ready to go on a military base for a very important couple of days. So I'm on the phone talking to John. What do you think? Okay, meet us at the. So he meets us at the gate. You know, tries to explain, blah blah blah. You know, no dice. Okay. Well, the first deal, the first ceremony that's going to begin, you know, in an hour. So I have to drive my sister into Del Rio to a lovely cupcake shop. And uh, where she could listen to country music for many hours. And uh, 
and I uh, drove back and um, you know, uh, threw my, uh, my suit on. We went to the first uh, part of the ceremony and stuff. Uh, and it's not the actual graduation, but it's uh, one aspect of it. And, and uh, at any rate, uh, we're, we're leaving, and we actually run into the, uh, the colonel, who's the uh, commander of the base. And he's, oh, yeah, parents, great you have here, and awesome. We got your, your dad's here. We got three grandfathers. Oh, great. And he's a very personal guy. We have this whole conversation with him. And the whole time I'm thinking, should I say something? Should I say something, you know, about my, yeah, but there's this one little thing, you know, if you kind of help us out here, you know. And, and I did, and uh, so we, we, we go up to the O Club, there's a whole thing, and some awards and all that, and he gets up and gives this whole spiel, you know, it's all about the parents, so glad you could hear, and you know, if anything we can do, if anything we can do, help you, and okay, okay, it's one of these, you're praying, and if, if I get a chance to talk to him one more time, I'll just go for it, well, sure enough, a crowd of people, go, hey, you know, sees me again, how's it going? Okay, here we go, Lord. Uh, sir, can I have a word with you? Oh, certainly. And, I, and I, anyway, I just tell him the whole story. He says, well, that's no good. Where's your sister right now? Well, she's at the cupcake shop. Yeah, shop in Del Rio. <laughs> Get her to that front gate, you know, and I'm going to call up there. And he gets me saying, it's like, why? He is the only guy on the planet right then that could have made that happen. No exaggeration. <laughs> He's the only guy on the planet that could have made that happen because he had the character to e even hear the story and be concerned. And he had the authority to do something about it, and he did. So Auntie Debbie, <laughs> just that first little deal, but she, she got, got in, and, uh, and they set her up with some kind of an ID so we could get in and out and all that stuff. And it was, uh, it was an awesome time. But man, authority uh, in a name uh, is super important. And that's what Peter is saying here. He's attributing this miracle to this name of Jesus, who is the just one, the prince of life. He's the son of God. Uh, and he's going to say, there's no other name under heaven given to men, whereby we must be saved. Then he tells them about the resurrection, verse 15. And killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead, of which uh, we are witnesses. And of course, this man then becomes proof himself. So Peter's faith certainly preceded the message because he had the faith to grab this guy and lift him up, see him instantaneously healed, uh, and then seizes the opportunity uh, that it affords him there in the temple area uh, to share the gospel. Uh, verses 17 to 26, uh, we're seeing that he proclaims a message of hope because now he kind of really, now that he's gotten their attention, <clears throat> he kind of gets down to it. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he is thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets, from Samuel and those who follow, as as many have spoken, have also foretold these days. You were sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. And we see here, it's certainly a message of hope. And it begins by being, being very gracious. And we may kind of uh, not be, being Jewish living in the first century, uh, may miss right over this when he says, Now, brothers, I want you to know what you, that you acted in ignorance. It's the same thing that Jesus says from the cross, saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Uh, and what it meant to them was there might be a little bit of hope. There might be a little hope for us because he said that. Because if you sinned intentionally, there was no sacrifice. There was no hope for you. Sacrifices were for when you sinned un unintentionally. I was supposed to do that on that day? Man, I didn't even know that. I better go down and make a sacrifice so my sins can be, uh, be forgiven, so they can be atoned for. But when you just <laughs> full on do stuff and rebel against God, uh, you're just out. I mean, there's not, nothing you can do. David, for example, 
when he has, uh, uh, commits adultery and then murders uh, Bathsheba, Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite, uh, there was no sacrifice he could make. Um, he thought he had it all covered up and so forth. And of course, you know the story of Nathan the prophet coming to him. Uh, David only had one hope. His hope was to throw himself on the mercy of God. And if God forgave him, it would be by grace and grace alone. So David's one of the few characters in the Old Testament that really understood that, <coughs> that concept very well. So when, when these guys understand that, in other words, he's saying, and you guys deliberately sinned, you put the Messiah on the cross. Pilate was trying to let him go. He was going to, he was going to, you know, you got to let him have that murder, Barabbas. But no, you asked for him. Kind of, kind of the bad news, kind of heavy there. And, uh, but then he comes back and says, but, but. And they're, they're like, all right, we're, the miracle, this guy rose from the dead. They're all witnesses. <coughs> we're, we're toast here. But he says, but you acted in ignorance. So he, he, this is a very gracious statement that he makes right, right, at, the, right at the beginning which is important to know. Uh, and then secondly, he directs them to the prophets, verse 18. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets, that Christ would suffer, he is thus fulfilled. So uh, according to Peter, right from the get-go, uh, the prophets have been declaring not just that the Messiah would come, uh, not just his character, not just where he would be born, where he would come out of, you know, how he would die and all these other details. Uh, but they actually foretold that he would suffer. He would suffer and that he would die. Because there's also the prophecies of him establishing his kingdom one day. Uh, if you're Jewish in the first century uh, and you're living under the Roman rule, you're kind of hoping for that kingdom thing right, right then. And, uh, and they were. Uh, but uh, Peter is saying, but the prophets had always said this. You can look, look at Isaiah 42 and start to, uh, in that chapter and start reading. And uh, all the way through, pretty much the rest of the way, there's uh, constant comments about the Messiah and that he would suffer. And certainly that culminates in chapter 53, uh, just one verse of, of that chapter, verse 5 of the Messiah. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Uh, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes uh, we are healed. And we could go on and on. Uh, and, uh, and Peter then is reasoning with them from the scriptures. You and I sometimes, well, our friends don't even know the scriptures. Uh, but we can still reason with them and try to help them understand. Again, he brought a major current event into it, in this case, the crucifixion of Jesus. And then he makes an appeal to the scriptures. He's gracious about it, but he's telling them the truth. He's giving them the good news with the bad news. Verse 24, yes, all the prophets from Samuel, those who follow, as many have spoken, have also foretold these days. That was a big issue. I mean, uh, it's a big issue to Jewish people today, this idea that if Jesus is the Messiah, how in the world does he get crucified? Because cursed is he who hangs on a tree, according to the uh, Mosaic law. And so Peter has to deal with that issue. Sometimes it has to be dealt with today as well. And then his proclamation included the need to repent, which uh, we certainly see in uh, uh, the ministry of John the Baptist. First thing he says is repent. Jesus preaching, we, we see that as well, uh, to repent. We saw it earlier in Peter's message. We'll continue to see it in Paul's. Repentance means to change our mind. Uh, uh, what happens, we, we kind of get a distorted view of what repentance means. Because by about 150 A.D., uh, the Greek text gets translated into Latin. Uh, and Latin becomes the, uh, the, uh, the language uh, and the text of the church uh, for several hundred years after that. Uh, the word in Latin that gets translated repentance uh, turns out to mean doing penance. In other words, uh, uh, do penance uh, and you'll be saved. In other words, you go do something. Uh, you go say this 12 times. Uh, you go through this class. You do this. You do this. Uh, you have to do this. You have to be here. So it's stuff that you do in order for you to get saved. That is not what the word means. But you understand where the distortion comes from. Uh, and, of course, it, uh, maybe it was well-meaning, but it, gets, it, it just gets marginalized. Uh, uh, you know, given another 100 years, and the concept gets lost. It means to change our mind. To change our mind. Because, uh, uh, you know, the Bible says... All have sinned to come short of the glory of God. I'm, I'm not that bad. You know, I mean, you're not that bad? Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, don't lump me together with everybody else. My goodness. I, I mean, I know a lot of people that are worse than I am. Oh, really? I guess you're not saved then. Because you have to change your mind and agree with what God says. That, that, it's a change of mind. But we're, you know, what God says this and we decide, 
I think it's a good day to agree with God here and uh, review stuff. Uh, Charlie is an example who listened to uh, J. Vernon McGee on the radio for a couple of years. Uh, and every time J. Vernon McGee would say, uh, we'd call him a sinner, then he would turn the radio off and cuss out J. Vernon McGee. What's interesting in the story uh, uh, is, uh, in case you don't know Charlie, Charlie's 100 years old. He's, he's not feeling well. That's why he's not, uh, not here today. You might want to pray for him. But he, he actually, he, he bought J. Vernon McGee's cassettes through the whole Bible. And he would still listen to him and cuss him out when he said that he was a sinner. <laughs> but then one day, he said, I realized he was telling the truth. I was a sinner. What did Charlie do? Changed his mind. He repented, which opened the door for salvation. Uh, that's, what, that's what the word uh, means here. Now, that's what Peter is telling, telling them. And the, in the, it comes with two things. Uh, Peter says that um, if you do this, uh, your sins will be pl plotted, uh, blotted out. I like what the NIV says because it uses a surfing term. Uh, if you got any of it, it says your sins will be wiped out. It says your sins will be wiped out. They're just gone, man. They're uh, they're they're no more. Uh, it means to be completely removed. It means to no longer have a, a guilty feeling, a guilty conscience uh, uh, about your sins, which is an awesome thing. Uh, a writer of Hebrews uh, talks about this this aspect that the law could never give give us, which is a Clear conscience. Does that mean I don't feel guilty about my sins? Well, if you commit them, you probably do, and you need to come to the Lord and ask Him to, uh, to forgive you. Uh, but you don't have to be condemned by them. There, therefore, is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ, uh, Christ Jesus. Uh, our, our coming to faith in Christ is based on our repentance and faith in Jesus, and He then infuses or gives us eternal life. And one aspect that has nothing to do with morality is not what you can do. It's simply what he's done for you through faith. And that's, that's Peter's uh, point here and certainly one we need to uh, remind ourselves. Because if we do that, then times of refreshing may come for the presence of, of the Lord. And that word refreshing means relief. And I can tell you, uh, when, I, when I got down on my knees and, and, uh, and prayed and asked the Lord uh, to forgive me, and in my mind, there's some very bad things that, uh, that, that I had done. I can tell you, the, uh, if you when you have that, that internal assurance uh, that God is actually doing and working in you and he's forgiven you, it's a relief. <laughs> it's, it's a relief uh, to know that you're going to be with the Lord one day. It's a huge relief. And, uh, you know, when we take communion here in a little while, uh, we want to experience that because we're going to remind ourselves through the elements that our sins have been blotted out. They've been wiped out. Separate as far as the east is from the west. And that's supposed to bring relief and remind us. Because we do have an enemy that would kind of put a couple little thoughts in our brain once in a while like, hey, yeah, don't believe that. <laughs> you know, you think God doesn't remember? You think God has Alzheimer's or something? He knows, you know. Satan doesn't talk to you that way. But, yeah, uh, you know, those thoughts come. But, uh, again, God doesn't have Alzheimer's. He has chosen, he has chosen in terms of judgment against us to never remember or ever bring up our sins to us again. That's what Peter is saying here, and that brings times of refreshing. The third thing that he mentions does not occur, which is interesting, verse 20, uh, where he says, And that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of the restoration of all things. Two things about this. The restoration of all things means when all things become like they were before the fall. In other words, when things become like they were in the Garden of Eden before sin entered the world. Jesus Christ will return and things will be made like they were before the fall, is what Peter is saying. And he's saying that if all Israel would repent and receive Jesus as the Messiah... Jesus would come and set up his kingdom and all things would be restored. You mean, it, you mean if, all, if all Israel right then did that, that would happen? Yes, that would happen. That's what Peter says. We know it didn't happen. We know that they rejected him nationally. And even through the preaching here, there's going to be a couple thousand that get saved. But certainly not all Israel is going to get saved. But one day they will. And when they do, that's what's going to happen. Revelation 19, Jesus Christ will return back to planet Earth, when that remnant of Jews that are supernaturally protected by God 
out there in southern Jordan, uh, when they look up and, uh, uh, as he said, uh, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They are going to recognize him. Jesus will return and all things will be restored. So the repentance brought sins being blotted out, times of refreshing, but it did bring Jesus back to planet Earth because as a nation, that repentance and those things has not happened yet. Uh, the other thing about the proclamation, it reminds them of the promise to Abraham. Verse 25, you are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So you and I, if we've come to faith in Jesus Christ, it's all predicated upon a, a promise God made to Abraham uh, and his physical descendants that through him there would be a seed, singular, a person that would come. And through one person, he would have the ability to bless the whole earth. That one person is the Messiah, uh, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Notice also, he, uh, he mentions this idea of the gospel going out in verse 26. Notice he says, it's to you to the Jewish people first. God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you, the Jews, in turning away every one of you from your own iniquities. And, th and that's still true today. Paul says in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Jesus, when he was in with the uh, Gentile woman, a woman, a Samaritan woman at the well, you remember that, uh, that story, uh, she says to them, uh, we worship here in Mount Gerizim. You know, you, you Jews, you, you worship there in Jerusalem. And he says, salvation is from the Jews. You got it all wrong. Uh, and so uh, if certainly a Jewish context, this is being preached in, but a truth that we need to, uh, to remember. And of course, we went into uh, great detail uh, into uh, uh, the, the tragedy of how this has not been remembered when uh, we were in our studies in Romans uh, 9, 10, uh, and 11. Peter's faith certainly preceded his, uh, his message. And, uh, and of course, uh, people were, will be a lot more apt to hear our message and what we have to say about Jesus Christ. We actually, <laughs> exercise, we actually believe it. We actually live it and, uh, and exercise it be, before them. Uh, he, he points his message uh, to Jesus Christ. And, and so should we when we're, when we're talking to others about what God has done in our lives. And certainly his message... Uh, was a message of hope. He was gracious. You guys acted in ignorance. You need to repent uh, and change your mind about the Messiah. And if you do, your sins will be blotted out. Uh, you can have times of refreshing from the Lord. And as we get into chapter 4 next time, <clears throat> we'll see that 2,000 uh, 2, of these men were converted and came to faith uh, in Jesus Christ on, uh, on that day. But I think just in, in, in closing here, before we do communion, just, just this idea <laughs> that uh, that Jesus and that Peter and John in particular in this case <laughs> walked by this guy all the time. Uh, I don't know if they ever gave him money or gave him the time of day. But uh, on this occasion, they were prompted by God, uh, by the Holy Spirit, to say something to him, to look at him. God gave them the faith to believe that this guy was going to get healed on the spot. And they simply followed followed through. Uh, and, I, uh, and then, of course, that then... Uh, led to an opportunity to share the gospel. One something happens to one person, and two thousand <coughs> get saved. We always say, "Disciple the few that win the many." Uh, you know, the gospel is about preaching unto one person, just one person. And after that, it's amazing what God can do. Uh, and there may be someone this week that you've walked by a dozen times or several dozen times. You see them all the time, and you've never said anything to them about the Lord. Uh, and maybe just, you know, I don't know, maybe you're just busy uh, or maybe uh, you just weren't really listening. I just want to encourage you to try to listen to the Lord. Uh, I don't know if it'll be a beautiful gate or not, <laughs> but uh, it might be some place where you go all the time and you see the same people all the time. And uh, it'd be open to the Lord prompting you to talk to somebody about the Lord this week because you can do it because you're only the instrument. It's not really you. It's not your power. And it's not because you're living an exceptionally godly life that God would choose to use you on a particular occasion. He just wants to use us. He's trying to reach a, a lost and a dying world. If I were God, I would have done it a different way. But he's chosen to use us as, as his ambassadors. Uh, and uh, 
I just want to say, I think Peter and John were pretty excited about all this as well, you know, to, to be part of this whole thing. And they're not taking any glory, but uh, I think they had to be pretty excited about the whole thing. Uh, it, and they better be because they're going to prison for it. <laughs> we're going to see that next week. Doesn't mean life is going to be easy because the Lord is, is using our life, but it sure makes it a lot more exciting, that's, that's for sure.
Sing like 